don't even know where to begin. Um, for many people, unfortunately, the organization MOVE, just like the Black Panthers and so many other cutting-edge freedom-fighting organizations are systemically, systematically being written out of history. So can we remind our audience a little bit about MOVE and what leads up uh, to this horrific act uh, that took place with the bombing um, in the aftermath? Okay. Um, <clears throat> very succinctly, very briefly, the MOVE organization is an organization founded by a black man called John Africa back in the early 1970s. John Africa brought people together from various races, religious beliefs, economic backgrounds, just all over the place, brought us together and gave us one common belief. That belief is in the all importance of life, meaning human life, animal life, plant life, the earth that feeds us, the uh, water that we must have to drink, the, uh, you know, air that we must have to breathe, the sun that we must have to warm the earth and shed light on the earth so that we can survive. These things, John Africa taught us, is the priority, is to be respected and protected. Um, because Moose belief is, is in life, we conflict with a system and those running the system that don't care about life at all. I mean, everything about this system poisons, pollutes, exploits, enslaves, maims, kills life. You know, they don't care about life. And because MOVE not only exposed this, you know, atrocity, and because we live a life that clearly shows people that we can live and be healthy and happy and content without doing these things to the earth, we're a threat to this system. We're a threat to this system. You know, move God is life, Mother Nature, our, our mama, our real mother. And because we are protective of her, you know, this system wants to literally exterminate us because they couldn't buy us off, couldn't bribe us, and couldn't intimidate and brutalize us into submission. They just made a decision that they had to, you know, just kill us off. If, if they couldn't reach us and, and bring us to their way, then they just had to get rid of us because their God is money. It's keeping this system afloat, keeping the status quo. And anything that, you know, conflicts with that, challenges that, exposes that, is a threat. You know, move women, have our babies naturally at home. Right. Where does that leave the medical industry? You know, we uh, don't style our hair. Our hair is in locks. It grows naturally. And we don't go to salons to get our locks, you know. They grow naturally. Where does that leave the cosmetic industry? Even to the point where they have salons that charge you hundreds of dollars to do your locks. Now, what do they have to do to your locks, you right. know? Um, we're a threat to a system whose only interest is in making money and maintaining the status quo. In the movie, many people would probably be surprised to know that MOVE had um, that sort of position, which many times we associate with white folks who are vegan and animal rights activists and what have you. Um, the type of uh, position that you all took that was very rooted and, uh, and, and willing to defend it is something that, you know, would appear for many people to be uh, out of step 
with the larger African American community. How do, how have we moved to that point where we don't associate veganism and vegetarianism and animal rights uh, and all that sort of stuff um, with us as a people? Uh, that's a very good question because uh, it's sad to say that, well, particularly in the very early days of move, we met much more resistance from black people than we did with white people. It's amazing, you know, um, particularly when you understand that the things that I was just talking about is rooted in African tradition. Mm. You know, it really is. But this system has led not only us, not only, you know, African-rooted people, but Latino, you know, white, Native American. They have misled all of us away from life. Now, if anybody can tell me what is more important than the force that keeps you alive, then I want to know what it is. When a person is having an asthma attack, a heart attack, are they screaming for a tank of dollar bills or are they screaming for air, trying to get air? Hmm. You know? Right. I mean, in a situation like that, what's really important is very crystallized. But as I say, this is Moose belief. And because we were not compromised with this system, we were beat up, locked up. You know, uh, our babies were killed. I mean, both born and unborn pregnant move women were beat, stomped, kicked into miscarriage. And uh, a three-week-old move baby was trampled to death by cops. And through all of this murder and mayhem, not one single official was ever held accountable for their crimes against MOVE. Now, we're supposed to just sit back and quietly accept this, you know? No, we're not. That is not our belief. People either deliberately or not deliberately um, <clears throat> have often misinterpreted MOVE as being violent, but we're not. MOVE members are the most peaceful people you will ever encounter, but we're not stupid either. We're not misguided. We understand clearly the difference between violence and self-defense. Right. We don't believe in violence, but we most certainly do believe in self-defense. That is instinctive. It's an instinct uh, put in every living being by the God of life. There is not one species of life that does not defend itself instinctively when threatened, when attacked. Right. If you're just so, tuning in, we're talking with uh, Ramona Africa from the MOVE organization, and we're talking about the movie, Let the Fire Burn. In the movie, what is very riveting is a couple of things that I think address what you're talking about. Um, you show, or it's shown, the uh, community hearings that took place after this bombing um, where we saw everybody from the police to uh, move, organi uh, move organizers and former move organizers uh, questioned. Uh, and at the end of that, we come to find out that, this, that, that that commission found that the city of Philadelphia and its police departments were negligent um, in their actions. Can we talk a little bit about that and why there wasn't any sort of prosecution or accountability, even though this commission was put together by the mayor at the time who ordered the bombing. Well, you said the key word there. It was put together by the mayor. You know, what people don't know is that prior to that uh, May attack on MOVE, all we were demanding was an impartial investigation into the ongoing 
unjust imprisonment of our family members known as the Move Nine, who were arrested after a similar police uh, attack on Move without the bombing uh, in 1978. Right. And Wilson Good, before he became mayor, he met with us, said that, you know, he understood our position, that there were some questions, and, <clears throat> excuse me, that he was simply the um, managing director then, but when he became mayor, you know, if he became mayor, that he could do a lot more. Well, once he became mayor, he didn't have anything to do with us. We couldn't reach him. He would not do anything. But when we kept the pressure on about our family and he made a decision that we needed to be eliminated and a bomb was dropped on us and it got worldwide attention, he was very quick to put together an investigation. And this was not a community you know, inquiry or, you know, commission. This was a commission put together by Wilson Good with people he handpicked. Now, the other thing people need to know about that commission is that they asked me, I was in jail at the time, they asked me uh, to testify, to participate, and I refused. And some people didn't understand that. But my position was that they have a district attorney's office, they have grand juries, et cetera, that have subpoena power, that have indictment power. This commission could not indict anybody. Mm. And they're talking about this in-depth ex extensive investigation, when you investigate something, you're saying you're trying to find out what happened, that, you know, it's not clear what happened. Well, why was I sitting in jail throughout all this? If they didn't know anything, didn't know what happened, how, how did they come to the conclusion that I should be arrested? Right. You know, it's a truth. And, and And keeping in mind, you were actually in the building when it got bombed. Absolutely. I mean, and Absolutely. I don't think people can... It was almost burned alive. Right. I don't think people can fully appreciate that, and I want folks to just sit with that for a minute. And, you know, I know you probably gone over this a million times in your mind, but I think it's important that the audience just doesn't hear the word bomb. Ramona Africa on the phone went through it. She's still alive. She's talking. She's articulated. Uh, it's all good. Let's keep it moving. What's next? I, I don't think, you know, to, to see that in the movie and to understand and the way that they showed that some of the people ran back, quote unquote, ran back into the fire, which raised the question, like, why wouldn't you run out when you could uh, be free? Under You know, doesn't fully I don't think people can fully appreciate that there were police that were there that had that were worse than the fire so to speak can you yeah, talk well, a little bit about that I mean were police there that had literally weapons of war I mean they had 50 caliber machine guns m60 automatic rifles they had sniper rifles with silencers on them you know, uh, they had their sidearms, they had shotguns, they had 9 millimeter, you know, uh, weapons, a 20 millimeter armor-piercing anti-tank gun. I mean, they came out there to kill. Let's not mince words about this. They didn't come out there to arrest anybody. They came out there to kill. And the reason why there's this talk of people going back inside is because the instant we tried to come out and, and were visible to the cops in the alleyway, we were met with a barrage of police gunfire. Hmm. There is a um, medical examiner, examiner, a forensic anthropologist named Dr. Alan Mann, who works at the University of Pennsylvania but worked part-time for the city in the medical examiner's office, and 
This man was not by any means a move supporter, but he was called in to help identify the bodies that they pulled out of there. And this man made a public statement that this was not an accident, it was deliberate murder, and that the most horrendous part of this was that those responsible were never, ever held accountable. Now, this is not a move supporter. He also said that some of the bodies were found to have bullet fragments in them. Wow. From the police gunfire. So nobody is ever going to get in my face and tell me, you know, they were just trying to arrest us and, you know, a lot of the nonsense that, you know, has come up over the years. Um, this was a plan to murder. They started planning this over a year before May of 1985. They practiced uh, blowing up assimilation of our roof. They admitted this. Uh, the FBI gave the city of Philadelphia that C4, in fact, gave them 37 and a half pounds of it. No municipal um, government or police department has C4. That's a military explosive. Wow. You know, so the thing is that I really want to make clear, too, in the interest of time, um, the government, through the media, have told people that this bombing, this attack happened because of complaints from neighbors about us. Now, I'm not saying that some neighbors may not have had complaints about us, but what city block in this entire country exists where some neighbor doesn't have a complaint about another neighbor? Right. Where? And since when does the government care about black folks complaining about their neighbors. Since when? Right. And warrant a reaction like that? If they cared so much about those Osage residents, why didn't they do right by them after the bombing? You got Osage residents that are still suffering, you know, behind their homes and possessions being you know, burnt to ashes, and and they, them not being able to move back into homes that were rebuilt because they were so shoddy. Yeah. You know, the sinking foundations, leaking, leaking roofs, electrical problems, yeah. you know, and the city basically gave them their behind the kiss. They didn't try to do right by them. So where is all this concern? Right. About these Osage residents that the government claims uh, complained about us. And right. I that's was what led. I was shocked to see that had happened in the movie. Um, you know, two. One was what you just described, that the residents, the 61 homes, not families, because um, that's much more people when right. you think about it, that lived, in a, that lived under those roof. 61 homes. Um, just devastated with this bomb and this fire. The fact is that the mayor gave an order to let the fire burn, and then they show the clip with the police and everybody laughing at that. Can you talk about that? I mean, you're sitting there going, if if you didn't know this was real, you would think it was like a movie, like, you know, Lethal Weapon 4 or something like that. But this really happened. Yeah, well, you know, it should not really be all that surprising to people because, these things, I mean, literally, mass murder, this government has been guilty of this for decades, maybe even centuries. I mean, let's not forget the May Lai Massacre. This was not uh, military people. This was villages of women and children and non-military men that Colonel Cali just slaughtered. Let's not forget 
This is the country that bombed Nagasaki and Hiroshima, you know, and the effects are still being felt today. You know, I mean, this country has a a vicious, murderous history. Look what they did to the natives of this country. Right. Well, Brought we- them into virtual extinction. So it really should not be all that surprising to people that this government would go this far. What might be somewhat surprising to people or uh, perplexing to people is why they would do this to move. What is it about John Africa's move organization that this government felt so threatened by that they felt the need to go this far? Because, you know, they don't mind doing their dirt behind closed doors in the dark. But, see, John Africa, the move organization, knew that – You can't stop these people all the time from doing these crazy things, you know, committing mass murder. But what you can do is ensure that if they do come that way, that they don't do it quietly in the dark, that it's done out in the open for the world to see. Right. You see, because May 13th, like I said earlier, was not the first time that move babies and even adults have been killed by this system. Right. You know? Well, even when we talk about the bombing, you know, and again, I, I prefaced the, you know, all these remarks by saying that we have a lot of history that's been erased and being erased as we speak. And so that's why I wanted you to give that explanation as to who MOVE is. Some of that are listening to the show already know. But a lot of people are going, this is the first time they're hearing this information. Mm -hmm. And it's good to hear it from you um, versus what they would read in the papers or or somewhere else, especially when we know how what direction that is taking. Um, But in terms of talking about bombing uh, residents, black residents in particular of an American city, we can't talk about the bombing of, of MOVE and not talk about the bombing that took place, you know, at the turn of the century in 1921 in Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. You know, and I think a lot of people don't really understand that. And here, you didn't have uh, uh, an organization that was, quote-unquote, fighting the system. You had well-to-do African Americans in a place called Black Wall Street. And because they were self-sufficient, because they didn't have to rely upon the government to do for self, because they were following the dictates of a Booker T. Washington, who many people considered, you know, somebody who was accommodating to the U.S. government, they were bombed because there were folks that were jealous of them being that self-sufficient. And mm-hmm. I draw the line between the two because one was assimilated and accommodating the system, uh, but self-sufficient. The other one was fighting the system, but self-sufficient. The the common denominator seems to be self-sufficiency. Yeah, and and not only that, you know, some people look at MOVE and they say, well, you know, that happened because they was out there, you know, hollering, screaming, talking, demonstrating, confronting. But explain Amadou Diallo. Oscar, Oscar Grant, you know, explain all of the hundreds, probably thousands of people who go to work every day, maybe go on their vacation, pay their taxes or whatever. I mean, Amadou Diallo in New York was simply standing in front of the, the place he lived in mm-hmm. and was shot at 41 times and struck. 19 times, some of the bullets going through his feet indicating that he had been shot down, was in a prone position when they continued to fire at him. What about Oscar Grant? I've seen that uh, movie about him, and, I mean, that boy was just murdered. Right. Literally murdered. What was he out there demonstrating? You know? So it's like, No matter what you do or don't do, you stay.
stand a very, very high risk of being victimized by this system. And John Africa have taught Move that when something is a threat to you, the only solution is to get rid of the threat. You can't hide from it, compromise with it. You have to eliminate the threat. You have to get rid of it. And by by that, what I'm talking about is stop believing in and supporting this system that is the threat, you know, the ultimate demise of all of us. Let me ask you this. In the movie, one of the things that I think is um, may go over people's heads is that you all studied and read and were better than most lawyers that you could find um, because you all represented yourselves in court. You were on a couple of occasions. Can you talk about that commitment to um, really being up on the system and the laws and being able to handle yourselves in those halls of power um, without the assistance of, you know, uh, uh, legal defense teams and all that other stuff? Right. Well, first and foremost, we don't represent ourselves with legality. Uh, Occasionally, if there is something that we can point out as a contradiction in legality and what's being done to us, we do that. But our defense has always been the truth. And the truth is not something that you have to be taught in a in seven years in college, you Mm -hmm. know. Um, We are taught by John Africa to rely on ourselves because how can you rely on someone else to represent you, first of all, when they were not there, didn't see what happened, don't really know anything about what happened. Secondly, how can you rely on people that believe in and are taught the very the very laws and rules and beliefs that the judge and the prosecutor believe in? They all went to the same schools. They all believe in the same thing. So how is somebody like that going to represent you? Thirdly, at the end of the day, at the end of the trial, if you get convicted, who's going to jail? You or the lawyer? Right. You know? And finally... If people feel like, you know, it's foolish to represent yourselves, and some people have told us, well, don't you think the Move 9 would have made out better if they had, you know, some good lawyers? And we're saying, I would say 97, 98% of those that fill the prisons across this country, the two point what five million, two point five million people in prison, ninety seven, ninety eight percent of them had lawyers. Right. You know. So we represent ourselves according to the truth, according to our beliefs. I'll give you one simple example. The first time I went to court after uh, May 13th, I was in the hospital for my burns for about a month. So this was in um, July of uh, 1985 because I was in the hospital for a month, and then there was a short time before I actually went to court. Now, I go to court from the prison, and the judge comes out. And he's playing this role. Good morning, Miss Africa. Uh, This is just a preliminary hearing. You haven't been judged guilty of anything yet. You will have a trial in a short while, and that's when, you know, your guilt or innocence will be determined. Um, This is simply a pre-trial hearing, and 
I'm going to read off the charges against you. And uh, those charges are, he reads this laundry list of charges against me. Right. And at the end, ask me, now, do you understand, Miss Africa? Nine people out of ten, for several reasons, would say, yes, I understand. Mm -hmm. I said, no, I don't understand. You're sitting up there telling me that, I haven't been the judge guilty of anything that that, you know, issue will be dealt with later at trial. I said, but I came to court here. No, I said, I came here from prison. I came here in a sheriff's van, handcuffed and escorted by cops. Right. I was taken to a jail cell up on the seventh floor until I came down to this courtroom. Again, escorted by sheriffs and cops and handcuffed. I said, now, is that how you came to court this morning? The judge said, oh, no, no, Miss Africa, that's not what I'm saying. I said, but that's what I'm saying. You're hmm. sitting up there talking this innocent until proven guilty nonsense, and I'm not going to stand, stand here and allow you know, or I'm not going to stand here and hallucinate about innocent till proven guilty. I'm not going to let these spectators in this courtroom, you know, swallow that nonsense. Uh, and, and no, I don't understand it because there's no understanding in it. I said, you know, I was a judge guilty when they dropped that bomb on me and my family. You you drop bombs on people you see as innocent, mm. you know? And the only way that I could even think like that is because of my belief, the teaching of John Africa that opened my eyes and all moved people's eyes to the contradictions, the hypocrisy of the system. And right. that's why we're able to represent ourselves in court. What did, what did the judge say after that? Uh, he couldn't really respond. He just said, well, you know, I've read the charges against you and uh, some other legal stuff. What could he say? Right. <laughs> you know? what, what was the end result of that trial? Uh, at the end of, well, first of all, people should know that um, the cops came out to my home on Mother's Day, May 12th. The bomb was actually dropped on the 13th, but they began their assault on us on Mother's Day, Sunday, May 12th of 1985. Right, right. And um, they came out there with a warrant for four of us, myself and three of my sisters and brothers, alleging disorderly conduct, terroristic threats, nonsense from a, a, a non-incident that had happened two weeks earlier. So the first thing that happened during my um, legal journey was that all of the charges in the warrants that they came out there with were dismissed as having no basis. No foundation. Right. So what was really being said is that they had no basis to even be out there. Right. On the, so on the Mother's all those Day. charges were dismissed. Then I had charges on me uh, from what happened after they came out there. I was charged with um, arson, possession of explosives. Uh, simple and aggravated assault, riot, conspiracy, risking and causing a catastrophe. Everything that they did, they charged me with. Wow. So at the end of the trial, some charges were dismissed. I was acquitted of other charges, and I was finally convicted of riot. That's the charge I was convicted of. Wait, a riot for the bombing beat? When they dropped the bomb, they charged you yeah, with a riot? When, when you're talking about a riot, you're talking about a group of people acting in chaos, all right, 
Who did that more than the hundreds of cops acting in concert that came out there attacking us, tear-gassing wow. us, you know, uh, shooting thousand, over 10,000 rounds of bullets at us? The fire department, the firefighters that aimed four deluge hoses, four water cannons at us for hours, and they admit that those water cannons shoot um, 10,000 pounds of water pressure per minute, and they had four of them. So that's 40,000 pounds of water pressure. Right, and we should remind folks they didn't use those water cannons to put out the fire once it started. Hence the name of the movie, Let the Fire Burn. Absolutely. You know, um, one of the main people featured in the film is uh, Birdie Africa. Michael, uh, who recently passed. He was a little boy, young boy then at that time. Your thoughts on, you know, that and him just recently passing. um, What do we need to know about that young man? Well, the one thing that I always point out to people is that there's a lot of talk about Birdie being rescued from move and living a normal life. If Birdie was still in move, he would not have been on a cruise ship in a hot tub. All right, he would not have died like that. He would not. Okay. So that's one thing. The other thing is that you know, there's, because of Birdie, there's been a lot of talk about MOVE children. And MOVE has been getting a lot of attention lately because of this movie and because of Birdie and because of, you know, a lot of work that we're doing with right. people. And this government is insidious. It is. Because of all of the attention MOVE is getting, They've, like, waged a campaign against us, Um, uh, a detailed, crafted campaign against us to push people's buttons. There has been several news articles here in Philadelphia and, and on the news across the country after Birdie's passing. And there's been this... uh, misinformation put out about move people abusing our children, our children being malnourished. That is such a vicious, ridiculous lie. Our children ran over 10 miles from Osage Avenue to one of our houses outside of Philadelphia in Chester, Pennsylvania, a distance of at least 10 miles, more probably like 11 or 12. And we're talking about 7 to 10-year-olds at that time. Mm. What malnourished, abused child can do that? Mm. You know, our children, uh, weather permitting, swam pretty much every day. We would take them over to the park at the end of our street, and they would run, you know, on the track over there. They would go swimming and work out over there. What, not only what malnourished or abused children could do that, but how many children of people outside of move could do that? Right. You know, and... I just want people to really understand that this is nothing but a campaign to try to smear MOVE because all of these years that MOVE have existed, close to 40 years now, people are more and more attracted to MOVE. They understand better what MOVE is talking about, what our belief is, and the righteousness in it. And that is not in this system's interest. It is not in this system's interest. You know, so we've been uh, hearing and seeing the rumblings of this nonsense, you know, 
about uh, move children being malnourished. The one picture that is generally put out there about Birdie is the picture of him sitting in the back of the police van on May 13th. When you look at Birdie sitting in that van, you see a trim, fit little boy. You can see the muscles in his side because, you know, it's a sideways photo. Right. You can see the muscles, you know, and that is not the sign of a malnourished, abused child. Furthermore, they in one news article that I read here in Philadelphia, um, Berghire, the cop who lied and said that he saved Birdie, he lied. But anyway, he said that the first thing Birdie said when uh, they took him into custody was, don't shoot me, don't shoot me. Yeah. The second thing he said was that he was hungry. And they put that out there to, again, try to imply our children being malnourished and not eating. I'm, my family and I are in the midst of a response to that because Birdie, by the time he had been taken into custody, had been deluged with water cannons, had been tear gassed, had over 10,000 rounds of bullets fired at him, right. you know, had been bombed and almost burned alive. Over, you know, the previous, say, 24 hours from May 12th to May 13th. Now, what is so surprising or incredible that the boy would say he's hungry? When did he have time to eat? Right. You know, but see, they are so insidious that they just plant the little seeds right. out there to try to get people to think a certain way. Right. Well, we're glad that we were able to get you on to kind of give some additional insight uh, as to what is happening in the movie uh, Let the Fire Burn. As we close out, Ramona Africa, I want to ask you, there are some things that will raise questions. Um, they show uh, the use of profanity, and they said this was the reason why the cops came, that you all would speak in harsh tones on bullhorns, and that's what made the neighbors upset. And then there was a point in the trial where they were saying that um, one of the former members, her son, was instructed to beat her. How, how do we look at that? What do we take from those two things? One simple thing. Consider the source. I mean, some things are true. We did have a bullhorn on our house that we spoke over. But it was not all day and all night like they tried to portray. And yes, we do use quote unquote profanity. But when we talk about a cop that would trample a three week old baby to death, crush his head, what words would you use to describe that person? Right. We call him an MF. That ain't even harsh enough. You know? And people should not be so shallow as to be or at pretend to be so disturbed by words like MF and not be disturbed by what those words are describing. Right, right. You no. Know? Yeah, and no move person was ever instructed to beat their mother. Okay. Never. Well, we appreciate that. I mean, those, I think, would be the question marks that would be raised and see in the film. Um, is there anything that you would want to add about this uh, film, Let the Fire Burn, that we should uh, really peep? Well, just that... Um, Jason Oster, the filmmaker, had done two extensive interviews with me about this and chose not to use any of it in the film. Now, of course, that's his decision, but I just really question why 
and how he could use, you know, back information, older information, and not include, you know, the only adult survivor, all the information that I put out. Right. That, to me, is a question. Um, the film overall, you know, doesn't defame move, you know, um, I feel like it could have been a lot better, could have included more detailed information, but it also could have been a lot worse. So, you know, people, I'm not telling people not to go see it or anything. People should see it because you will find out things that you didn't know. And, you know, uh, it will inform people about move. Right. So, well, as I said, no, it was it was riveting. Not to see it, but that's just my take on the film. And before we close out, I just want to give some contact information. Sure. How people can contact me and the Move organization. Go ahead. We can be reached at two one five three eight six one one six five. Again. Two one five three eight six one one six five, or uh, by email at. O N A M O V E L L J A at Gmail dot com. On the move L L J A at Gmail dot com. And as we close out, we should say there's a couple of things. People should look up the name Frank Rizzo, who's featured in the film, and understand that uh, before there was a Daryl Gates and uh, a Rudolph Giuliani and all that, the prototype was uh, that individual who was the police chief and later mayor. And you want to understand tyranny, you you should definitely understand Frank Rizzo. Um, the other thing that is not talked about is the plight of Momia. Um, and, you know, Momia associated in Whitmove. Can any updates on him that we should know? Well, thanks to the people, the the you know, hard work, uh, consistent hard work of the people. We got Mumia off of death row, but he is now sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and that is not acceptable at all. So we're continuing the push, the work, to bring him home where he belongs because he is innocent. So keep your eyes and ears open, you know, about programs and information on Mumia. Right, and um, also the movie. There will definitely be stuff happening even out on the West Coast on December 9th, the date, date that Mumia was uh, arrested and almost killed, December 9th. And the move 9? The Move 9, we're still working very hard and consistently to bring them home. Each of the nine were sentenced to 30 to 100 years each in prison, and uh, they became eligible for parole in the year 2008. Right. Uh, they have seen the parole board approximately four times since their 30-year minimum expired in 2008, and the parole board denies them each time, saying that uh, they refuse to take responsibility. In other words, move people won't lie and say they're guilty of something they're not guilty of, right. despite the fact that the prison has recommended move people for parole, the prisons that they're in. Um, they don't have any bad prison records, you know. The parole board will not parole them. Right. And and one thing that documentary does show is what took place that day. And I think that's pretty compelling mm -hmm. um, when you consider what happened to them um, in the aftermath and what went down that day. Um, right. You know, it's just absolutely despicable. Uh, Ramona Africa, thank you so much. Thank um, you. The name of the documentary is Let the Fire Burn, Ramona Africa, the surviving member of that tragic day, May 13th, 1985, when a bomb was dropped on America, uh, was dropped in America on the city in Philadelphia, uh, the city of Philadelphia, Osage Avenue, and uh, the mayor said, let it burn, 61 first houses. First black mayor. First black mayor said, let it burn, 
And uh, I think that's an eye-opening account of uh, what went down, and people should definitely uh, look at that so that history is not erased. And we're glad that we had you on to fill in the gaps. So, Ramona Africa, peace to you. I appreciate that. Thank you. On the move. Okay. First of all, as you said, I'm Ramona Africa. I'm Minister of Communication for the MOVE organization. I am also the sole adult survivor of the bombing and currently the only survivor, surviving adult or otherwise, uh, as my little brother, Bertie Africa, uh, died a couple of years ago. Um, I'm a former political prisoner because I did survive the bombing. I am the only person to be charged with anything or to go to jail for anything after the bombing. Um, I am a representative of the International Concerned Family and Friends of our brother Mumia Abu-Jamal. But most importantly to me, I'm a revolutionary, and I make no apologies for that. I'm proud to say that. Um, I didn't know what a revolutionary was before encountering John Africa and John Africa's MOVE organization. So that's who I am, a committed MOVE member. Uh, What people really need to know, a couple of things that people need to know that those running this system uh, desperately try to hide from people is the fact that the May 13th bombing of our home was actually initiated on Sunday, Mother's Day, May 12th of 1985, and it went into Monday, May 13th. But they came out there planning to wipe us out on Sunday, Mother's Day. Another thing that people really need to know is that contrary to what officials have gotten the media enforcing people, um, the bombing of me and my family did not happen because neighbors had complaints about MOVE. Let me make that clear. I am not saying that some neighbors didn't have complaints about MOVE. Yes, they did. But you name me one neighborhood in this entire country where one neighbor doesn't have complaints about another neighbor. And they don't Mm -hmm. drop bombs on these neighborhoods because one neighbor has complaints about another neighbor or neighbors. Secondly, I mean, when has this government, members of the government, those that run this system, when have they ever cared about black folks complaining about their neighbors? Since when? You know, uh, they they don't care about us complaining about anything, let alone about our neighbor, you know? So people really need to uh, think about that for a minute to uh, really understand that what happened with the bombing and murder of my family didn't happen because some neighbors complained about us. What was really behind it is our unrelenting fight for our MOVE sisters and brothers, known as the MOVE Nine, who were arrested, well, first of all, who were attacked And the Rizzo, Frank Rizzo administration tried to kill off my family back in 1978, on August 8th of 1978. And in their fervor to kill, move people, kill my family, they ended up killing one of their own. James Ramp, Officer James Ramp was killed by friendly fire. And Mm -hmm. MOVE 
<clears throat> did not invent that term, friendly fire. This system invented that term because obviously there were numerous situations where people fighting on the same side injured or killed their, you know, colleagues, their comrades, their fellow fighters. Right. Move yes. didn't invent that term. But when Move makes it clear that James Rant was killed by friendly fire and the evidence shows it, people want to act like, you know, we're crazy or we're just saying that friendly fire. What are you talking about? But we didn't invent that term, <laughs> you know. Anyway, our family was wrongly, deliberately accused of killing James Ramp. James Ramp was shot with a bullet traveling on a downward angle. The cops admit that all of my family members in August of 78 were in the basement of our home. They had went from the third floor to the second floor uh, down to the first floor and, you know, satisfied themselves that everybody was in the basement. How can somebody in a basement six feet below street level shoot somebody standing six feet above them on street level and have the bullet travel on a downward angle. That's physically mm. impossible. If they want to say that my family killed James Ramp, you know, then they would have to be saying the bullet was traveling on an upward angle, up from the basement, up the street level, you know, up James Ramp's body, not yeah. downward. If the bullet traveled on a downward angle, which is what they say, then obviously someone above him shot and killed him. But my family, nine members of my family, known as the Move Nine, were arrested uh, before they could even be processed at the police administration building. Uh, the city administration under Rizzo sent a demolition team out to my home uh, to move headquarters and completely demolished it. Now, that was the scene of the crime. They're saying that my family shot and killed Officer James Ramp from our home. So that makes our home the scene of the crime. You know, mm -hmm. how do you destroy vital evidence, the crime scene, and proceed with a trial? If you say somebody had five kilos of cocaine and you destroy the cocaine, you flush it down the toilet or whatever, how do you proceed with prosecuting that person? for possession of cocaine. Where is it at? You know? But they <clears throat> prosecuted my family for shooting Officer James Ramp from our home and demolished our home. Our family ended up going on trial, was convicted, all nine MOVE members, convicted of shooting Officer James Ramp with one bullet from one gun. Now, how do nine people do that? You know, they could not say that any one move member shot and killed Officer Ram, but Judge Edwin Malman convicted nine of our family for it. I mean, it's one thing if you can say, well, Phil Africa shot and killed James Ram but you were all in the house together. We believe you conspired together to do this, so you're all guilty. That's one thing. But if you can't say that any one MOVE member shot and killed James Ramp, how do you convict nine, all nine MOVE members? 
and then proceed to sentence each one of the nine to 30-year minimums, 100-year maximum sentences. This is the outrage that move protested uncompromisingly ever since it happened, okay, in 1981. And because of our unrelenting fight for our family members, for the release of our innocent family members, because officials could not intimidate us, could not bribe us, you know, or co-opt us, because they could not shut us up or stop us in any way, shape, or form, they conspired, practiced, and came up with plans and rehearsed those plans to come out to Osage Avenue. And since nothing else worked, well, they were just going to have to wipe us off the map. They were just going to have to exterminate us and be done with us for once and for all, you know. That is what the May 1985 bombing was about. Just like in 1978, in 85, the plan, the bottom line was to kill, move people, man, woman, child, even our animals, our dogs and cats. They didn't care. Anything related to move, they were ready and willing to exterminate, you know. And that's what it was really about. And people need to understand this because while those running this system want to convince people that move is crazy, irrational, you know, that uh, we're a threat, that we're violent and vicious, that simply is not true. What those running this system want is to convince people to trick, to dupe, bamboozle people, in the words of our brother Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm, mm-hmm. bamboozle people into accepting and believing that we have no right to defend ourselves against this system of oppression and viciousness, that we are supposed to accept anything they hurl at us that they spit down on us. We are supposed to accept it. Well, John Africa, Moo's founder, have taught move people and anybody that's willing to listen to what's right, to what makes sense, that the instinct of self-defense is instilled in every living being from the tiniest insect to the hugest uh, living being that you can think of. That's instinct in everything that's alive. Now, unless you are saying that masochism, you know, allowing yourself to be hurt, be, you know, assaulted, murdered, is right, is the norm, is what you're supposed to do, then it's clear that move is not wrong for fighting back, for defending ourselves against this rotten system, defending our family against this rotten system. We will never sit back in quiet frustration and allow those running this system to wrong us, to physically hurt, abuse us, to kill us, kill our babies without fighting back. 
May 13th was not the first time that move babies were murdered by this system. It was not the first time. In fact, it is one of the things that caused move to take a defensive stand against this system on May 20th of 1977, which led into August 8th of 1978. But I, I'm just giving you this background, not only on uh, what MOVE have encountered over mm-hmm. the years, but also to give people uh, John Africa's teaching food for thought as to the righteousness, the urgent necessity for us to stand up and defend ourselves, and that that doesn't make us criminal or violent. You are not violent when you're defending yourself. But you are violent if you allow yourself to be, uh, you know, bullied, assaulted, physically hurt. Because then, if you allow that, then you're endorsing violence. You're perpetuating it. And you are ultimately suicidal, masochistic. Because if you allow anybody to do whatever they want to you, beat you, stomp you, kick you, you know, then where does that ultimately lead? To death. That's and right. that's suicidal. Right. Ramona? Miss Africa. Yes. Oh, okay. We have we have we have a, a hand up. Wait wait a minute wait a, wait, a, <laughs> wait 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 a minute brother Matt wait a minute brother Matt before you bring on before you bring on the caller I I have a a, a few questions I'd like to ask Miss Africa um you know before before we before we take any calls because because for for many for for many of the local people the local Philadelphians that are listening to this many of them have never gotten an uh, a correct account of exactly what happened on that on that that day on on May 13th 1985. And so as you set the record straight Ms. Africa I would like for you to let people know who, who for 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 many of us who are blinded by what the media gives us you know who who will eat any of the food you know hand to mouth that the media feeds us I would like for you if you would to please Tell us something about move that we would never hear on the news. Because, oh. and what I mean by that is this: if we <clears throat> listen to, if we listen to, uh, uh, okay, I was fourteen years old when when the when the bombing happened. So, so um, not living out there in West Philly, and only listening to the to the news. Now, one one thing you definitely set the record straight. With was the the fact that the, well the the news accounts of the neighbors the neighbors complaining about about um your your activities during move but what I would like for you to enlighten us about is what were the what were the the motives of the move organization well I know that it was a black nationalist group. Uh, no, <laughs> what, we're not. What were your principles? We're not. You, oh, I'm sorry. No, we're not well, a black nationalist organization. There are white people in MOVE, Latino people in MOVE. Uh, there have been Jewish people in MOVE. MOVE is predominantly black, mm-hmm. but not solely black. And that okay. is because uh, MOVE's mission, you asked about that, like, what we're really, you know, about. John Africa brought people together from all different backgrounds, different races, different social and economic backgrounds, different religions, brought us together and gave us one 
common, for lack of a better word, religion focus, okay? And what that is, is life. John Africa taught move people that life is the priority. Nothing at all, whatever you can think of, none of it is more important than life. All of life without categories. I'm not talking about a a, a hug a tree, you know, kind of uh, theoretical, you know, liking of life. I'm talking about truly understanding the importance of life on all levels and being committed to life. And I'll give you some very crystallized examples of what I mean, you know. Um, Moo's first demonstrations were at the zoo, the Philadelphia Zoo, at the circus, at furriers where people that own these furriers and run them uh, were walking around like they had the right to exterminate in mass minks, seals, rabbits, foxes, all manner of living beings, all manner of animal life, and skin them of their coats, humans' backs, as if the coordinator of life, the creator of life, made a mistake and that the uh, uh, seal's coat, the rabbit's coat, look better on humans, on us, than it did on the rabbit that the creator of life put it on. You know, we demanded that they explain that because uh, people talk about the Holocaust, you know, the Jewish Holocaust, and one of the things that came out uh, was that the Jews, some Jews, most Jews, uh, were skinned and lampshades were made from their skin. And they say that's an abomination. It's horrible. And yes, it is. But so too is it horrible to take life, a species of life, and slaughter them in mass skin them of their coats, make fur coats for humans out of their coats, and sell them for profit, you know? It is an abomination to take living beings like lions from the jungles of Africa, separate them from their mates, from their babies, transport them across the water, enslave them in circuses and zoos, and call it entertainment. What John Africa pointed out is that black people especially talk about African slavery, you know, and Africans being kidnapped from Africa separated from their mates, their babies, transported across the water, and enslaved on plantations for their labor and be be beat and abused. Now, how is that different from what happens to animals that are kidnapped? You know, and if anybody wants to say, well, those animals don't feel what people feel. That's a lie. That's what the white slave owners said about black people. They don't have no feelings. They're not really human even. They would say that, you know. They're inferior. They're they're not like us. They don't feel like we do, you know. So to say that about any species of life, if it's alive, 
It has feelings. You know, it is coordinated by the creator of life to be free. Slavery doesn't come from God, from the creator of life. That's a man-made concept, you know. Uh, So that moves mission to wake people up, to teach people about the importance of life, not just like animal life, human life too. I mean, some of our other early, early demonstrations and moves was at unsafe boarding homes for the elderly where they were being physically and emotionally abused and their um, checks, their Social Security checks were being all but stolen from them, you know, and they weren't getting uh, the care that they were supposed to be getting in these homes. These homes, some of them were nothing more than fire traps, you know, and MOVE demonstrated against that, exposed it, you know. Um, Also, what is very important because it's life is the water. I don't care how rich you are, how much champagne you can afford to drink, you have got to have water. You cannot live without water, okay? The earth feeds us. We can't live without the earth feeding us, even though these arrogant scientists and industrialists think that they can make food better than Mother Nature, you know, better than the creator and coordinator of life can. That's why you have genetically engineered food, seedless food like grapes, like watermelons, like oranges, like all kinds of seedless, seedless cucumbers, you know. That's man's arrogance thinking that he can do it better than mama, but he can't, better than mother nature, he can't. Um, And people don't see it as important. They accept it because life is not important to people like it should be. The air we have to breathe. People accept the polluting of the air that we can't live without and then wonder where emphysema, lung cancer, et cetera, comes from, comes from the poison in the air. And the same with the water. Right now, it's not just uh, prisons, but it is uh, a serious issue in prisons at uh, SCI Mahanoy State Correctional Institute and Mahanoy State Correctional Institution at Greaterford, the water is toxic. It's tainted. And this is all that these inmates have to drink. The water and bathe in and bathe in. The water looks like tea. It is not clear. It looks like tea. And this is what they're forced to drink. But it's not simply a prison issue. What about Flint, Michigan? How many times have you heard on the news, boil your water because they'll say something like temporary, you know, happened. But that's bull. The water in West Philadelphia High School, and this was the, a new school. They just built it, built it. They closed the old one down, built this new West Philly High, and had to turn off the water and bring in bottled water because it was tainted. It's toxic. Not was. It is. Because they haven't cleaned it up, you know. Uh Mm -hmm. This is Moo's belief. It's our mission, you know, to treat 
life with the respect that life deserves because it's the force that's keeping us alive. We don't believe in this concept of superior man and inferior woman or animal. (laughs) You know, we don't believe animals are inferior to us, you know. Um, So this is our belief. We believe that all life is equal. All life is supposed to be free, healthy, satisfied. You know, when I say free, I mean free from any kind of uh, abuse, brutality, injustice, you know, racism on any kind of level, you know. And because we don't just say it, we live it, we demand it, that's why this system wants to kill us, kill us off. They don't want us influencing anybody else with the teaching of John Africa. You know, they don't, because if people really heard and understood what we're saying, the importance of it, that would be the end of this system, because people would not tolerate what this system is doing to life. I mean, they have trashed this earth that we're living on. And rather than acknowledge it and take the steps to clean it up, which is one thing, stop poisoning it, rather than do that to at least start moving in that direction, they say, oh, well, you know, there may be life on Mars or some other planet. You know, we'll be going back and forth up there, and we'll just go live on Mars. What? And trash that like you've trashed the Earth? You know, they already got trash floating around up there in the atmosphere. They admit that. So, you know, to cut it short, to to get to the bottom line here, Life is what's important to move because it's what keeps us alive, keeps us safe and on the right track. And when I say keep us safe, I mean safe from any kind of imposition, health-wise, physically or mentally, because when you think right, you are right. When you think mm-hmm. strong, you are strong. And this Very is good. what John Africa taught us. All right. All right, Ramona. Um, we have, we, let's see, our, our caller has waited patiently. Let's bring our caller who has a question or a comment, uh, 7752, can we? Brother Mac, I don't, wait, wait a minute. Um, let's see. She, she came back, there's 9271. Okay. Um, uh, I have a little. Okay, I bring her on now. All right, call her with. Okay, call her with the last numbers nine two seven one. Welcome to the Legacy of a Nation program, and thanks for for waiting. And and after you, nine two seven one. I see call her with the last numbers two zero oh, one three, and we'll take take your 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 call uh, after nine two seven one. Welcome to the Legacy of a Nation show nine two seven one. How are you? I'm great. How is everyone? Great. great. All is well. Good. Welcome, welcome to the show. You, you, All you right. Have a, you yes. have... I'm glad you cleared up that question of the neighborhood and all this other stuff because that all sounded always sounded kind of hokey. Um, and I wanted to know what types of activities were at the home that prompted them, prompted them to attack you in the first place. Okay. Uh, one of the main things is that we feed stray animals mm-hmm. that can't feed themselves. 
we would put food out for these animals, and they would eat it up. But the neighbors had a very real problem with us doing that, you know. Mm. They did not like that. Uh, We composted what they call today, you know, which is so acceptable, composting. We Mm -hmm. turned the dirt over around our house, and we um, fed the earth with fruit seeds, uh, potato peelings, eggshells, et cetera, you know, to fertilize the the soil, the earth, and um, people went crazy. You know, they did that back in 78 as well. Oh, my God, they're nasty, they're dirty, they're throwing garbage in the dirt. Well, they put a cute little word on it called composting, and now that's the thing to do, Mm -hmm. you know. Let me say this, too. Everything that John Africa uh, coordinated and moved people, everything that John Africa pushed from the very beginning of MOVE, well, till now, I'll say, um, people criticized us for, ostracized us for, and today those things are all the rage. Let's start with the beginning, you know, natural childbirth. Mm -hmm. People said, oh, my God, y'all are crazy. You're going to kill your baby. You're going to kill yourself. You've got to go to the hospital. What are they pushing today but natural childbirth? You know? That's right. Okay. Let's go to the next thing. Yeah. John Africa. Yeah, Ramona. Yep. Um, let's see. We we've got we we got to move got, on. We got to, we, the, the whole the whole classroom is has his hand has his hand up. Since since seven five two, um, with only about uh, with only about twelve or thirteen minutes uh, left, let us let us um, uh, give give uh, the the other callers a, a chance to pose a question okay. or make a comment. And and if there's if there's time, then we'll we'll uh, we'll, go, we'll go back. Send seven five two. Send seven five two. All right, I got you. I, I have you, brother Matt. All right, call with okay. the last numbers two zero one three. I'm going to bring you on now, as I promised, and then after that, call with the last number seven one two six. Okay, call with the last numbers two zero one three. Thank you for holding. Welcome to the Legacy of a Nation program. Did you have a question or comment for Ramona Africa? Yes, thank you, brother. Uh, peace and blessings to each and every one of you. Oh, uh, hey, you, my brother. Welcome. What, yes, welcome, sir, Dr. Dr. Siddiqui. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank yes, you, sir. brother. Uh, Sister Ramona, uh, uh, yeah. I, I really appreciate you. Uh, you're a true warrior, and i like to encourage you to continue on, and we must learn from you. Uh, hopefully, we are, we are learning from your experiences that you have gone through amongst all the other experiences that we have gone through as a people. And that day that uh, the move, uh, the bombing took place, uh, I had a, a, a food market on the corner of 48th and, uh, and Fallon Street, which is around 48th and Westminster. And right before the bombing, the bro- uh, one of the brothers who was a part of the movement uh, he said he had just escaped before all of this happened, and he ran down to my store, and we were talking for a while, and he ran down the whole story to me. And uh, this thing is real. You know, we must continue to resist and not continue to go for the bull crap. You know, we've been bamboozled, like you said, sister, and uh, I was on a couple, I was on a couple panels uh, uh, with you uh, in the past also. I know you okay. uh, probably don't remember me, but uh, there's a lot of people. Was that one are, of them was, at the Asian Arts Institute? Uh, no, was, no, okay. No, one of one of them was at the uh, the uh, Philadelphia Community years ago. Oh, and, okay. Uh, 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 with Kenny Gamble and so forth. So, 
Okay. But my thing is is that I really truly appreciate you and I and I pray that everybody's listening to your story, your experiences, because experiences are no more, no less than an opportunity to learn and to grow and to face the reality of really what's going on. And I, I pray that you continue to stay strong and keep your faith where it belongs. Sister, well, keep up well, the good work. Thank you very much, Kevin. Mm-hmm. I really, yeah. I really appreciate you, and I pray that the Creator will continue to bless you. And I will send always the the uh, the ancestors uh, before you to lead, God direct, and protect you. Well, thank you very much, brother. We're having a three day conference in May, May fifth, sixth, and seventh at the uh, Universal Auden Reed Charter High School, Brother Luke Ma, Kenny Gamble's uh, school, at 33rd yeah. and Tasker. And uh, we're taking the opportunity, creating the opportunity uh, with this three-day conference. It's all about move telling people who move is rather than mm-hmm. the media you know, Mm. rather than people who think they know and don't really know. Some well-meaning people who think they know and tell people things, but it's not the right thing, you know. So we're taking the opportunity to tell people who we are. What time is it? So um, on Friday evening, it's 6 to 9 p.m., and it's okay. all day Saturday and all day Sunday from 10 to, like, 6. But uh, you sister. can go to Moves website, onamove.com, O-N-A-M-O-V-E.com, and all the information is on there. Appreciate that, sister. And you carry on. All right, now, on a move. On a move. All right, we have... Uh... Caller seven one two six seven seven five two. Can we can, right. can we bring on? Absolutely. Uh, caller with the last number seven one two six. Welcome to the Legacy of a Nation program. Did you have a question or a comment for Ms. Ramona Africa? Um, peace and blessings, love and light, everybody. Um, I just had a comment um, for Sister Ramona Africa. Um, I actually work at Greater for Prison, and I had the awesome. Uh, privilege to meet with some members from MOVE, and I was, um, I'm honored, you know, I was honored to sit and talk with these brothers, and, you know, I honor you and your presence and you being here and speaking with us, and I always remember being a little girl, because I live uh, basically in Powhatan Village in University City, Mm -hmm. and I remember being a little girl, and and the incident happened with a little um, young baby was killed, and I remember um, mm-hmm. Speaking to the other brothers from uh, Move who were incarcerated and are incarcerated at uh, Greaterford, and hearing their stories and being able to sit in on their staffings and voting on their behalf, um, knowing that it was going to get turned down, but just their homeness and their peace and the message that y'all sent. And even then, as a young girl, and when Osage Avenue uh, happened, when you were bombed. I always remember having questions like, why would why would they do that? They didn't do anything wrong and remembering, you know, what happened. And just that my heart goes out to you and our uh, brothers and sisters who are now our ancestors. And I just, you know, just want to say peace, love, and light to you, sister. And it's an honor speaking to you. Well, I really appreciate that. And just mm-hmm. like I told the brother um, about that conference that we're having, uh, mm-hmm. I personally invite you to come out, you know, and join that us. Definitely. And thank you. Hello. Oh, we're here. Yeah. So, all right, all right. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, seven seven five two. If if you would take a station break and remind our listeners how they can take part in the conversation with about six minutes remaining, would you please? Brother Mac, I think we really should just keep rolling. <laughs> really, you know, you, you want to um, <laughs> you, you yeah, just keep going. <laughs> All right, uh, but to to take part in the conversation, 
You can let us know in the studio that you have a question or a comment simply by pressing the one on your cell phone, and we will recognize you by the last four numbers of your telephone number, thereby giving you anonymity. You can speak um, without anyone knowing who you are unless you want them to know. Uh, Ramona, thank you so very much. You have, uh, you have, you have brought to our attention uh, something that we already know, and that is that when you don't tell your story, it becomes his story. Mm-hmm. And, we, we, and, and, and the, the, the main mission of Legacy of a Nation, this show, for an hour, is to increase the awareness of the Aboriginal community. We describe the Aboriginal community as we black people, we African Americans, we Negroes, we Afro Americans, we descendants of slaves, we people who are Aborigines, in, who are indigenous, and, and who are natives to these lands of North, Central, and South America and all of the Caribbean islands. <clears throat> and I thank you so much. Um, but with, with only about uh, three or four minutes remaining, please please go ahead and tell us more about yourself, uh, more about Brother Matt. You and, uh, yes, sir. I believe we have more callers. Please, please. <laughs> Sun seven five two. Again, I, I, I thank you for, for 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 guiding me out of the ditch and pulling me out when I fall in in spite of it. Okay. Uh, uh call it with the last number uh call it with the last number is nine eight six three. Welcome. Welcome to the Legacy of a Nation show. Did you have a, a, a question for, for Sister Mona? Actually I have a comment for Sister Ramona. Uh, blessings to you, my sister. My heart goes out to you. Unfortunately, I can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Um, I unfortunately had the displeasure of having to incarcerate one of your members when the incident happened and everyone was being sentenced at a halfway house in Camden, New Jersey. I had the pleasure of speaking. This was after the bumming and after some of the members. No, we didn't have any members in um, in Philly or Jersey that ever got arrested after the bombing, particularly in Jersey. Maybe it it was was somebody that was a supporter. Maybe that was the case, but this was a federal Mm -hmm. pre-release center, so it would have been federal charges. Mm-hmm. That was brought That again. must have been a supporter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. he enlightened me as to the mission, the move mission, and I think it's very unfortunate that the movement came to light at a time when the ignorance of the people were of such that they did not know. I didn't know what mm-hmm. your total mission was. And so I think it's a great thing that you're now educating the folks. I've often said that you've got to educate before you can legislate. And so I applaud your efforts. And for those of you who are carrying on the mission that are on the move, it is indeed I, most necessary. I really appreciate that. And um, uh, the thing is, John Africa his teaching, the wisdom and clarity of it uh, is what a lot of people call before it's time because we have been educating people, talking to people for it's like 45 years or so now, but people couldn't hear it before. You know, they couldn't hear it. Um, But with the examples that people have gotten over the years. It's what, what's that woman Oprah calls aha moments, you know, yes. <laughs> when you, you finally get it, you know, yes. and that's what's happening. And unfortunately, you know, so many people have suffered along the way because people didn't get it at the time. And a lot more people are still going to suffer, particularly under Donald Trump. 
You know, I mean, you can't get past him, you know, but it's a shame that people have to go through this, you know, right. before things Unfortunately, I know that time is of essence, but I think it's behind the teaching of General McIntyre and others as we embark upon bringing the resurrected order of the Buffalo soldiers into the mainstream of tutoring our young men and young women that we'll be able to teach them to appreciate Mother Earth. And that is the only planet that we have. It's the only Earth that we have. So with your involvement, and I solicit your involvement, along with General McIntyre and others, including myself in the Southeast region, that we'll be able to bring a greater awareness as to what the movement is all about. If I can have your commitment to work with us, and we will work with you, please. Okay. Well, you know, MOVE have been doing this for a long time, despite all <laughs> that this system have come at us with. And we're certainly not going to stop now. And anybody that's committed to doing the time. same work, we have no problem working with. Praise okay. him, praise him, and thank you so much, my sister. And my blessings go out to you and to all of the others that have been under the suffering of your good intentions. Blessings to you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Lamy. Dr. Dr. Kirkland, thank you so much for, uh, for, for, for your wonderful comments. Ramona, thank you so very much for having, um, for having uh, enlightened us. And please accept our invitation to come back. All you have to do is just call, call in and, uh, and, 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 uh, you know, let us know that, that you, that you are there and that you can do that simply by, again, pressing the one on your phone. And when, when, when you got the floor, you've got it, but you have, uh, you have, you have touched on so many of the things that, that we are passionate about. And one of the one of them is increasing our awareness as a people. We are unaware of who we are. We are we're unaware of who the enemy is, and we don't even know that a war is being perpetrated against us. And um, and and uh, we, we're wondering we're wondering why we're falling dead, uh, and why our friends and, and and neighbors are falling dead around us, and and we don't even recognize that we are at war and we're being shot with. With uh, disinformation, with misinformation, and and uh, with downright lies. But again, thank you so much, uh, Sun Seven Five. You're very welcome, you, and thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to inform your listening audience. Please, please, please come back again and again. Uh, we are here every okay. Saturday, Sun Seven Five Two. If you would be so kind, uh, please thank our guests. And and, uh, and and sign us off until next time. Actually, um, today's uh, main topic was actually history, and next week the main topic is uh, is politics. And so, uh, okay. again, since since seven five two, I want to thank you for being my backbone and for guiding me out of the ditch whenever I when I whenever I go in there in spite of myself. Uh, uh, if you would please please sign us off. And again, thank you. All right. Okay. One last thing before we go. Uh, uh, Ram, um, Sister Ramona, did you ever write a book or anything like that? Is, or is there any type of publication that, that our listeners should, should look for, um, you know, that you may have written? Uh, I have not written a book. Move people have not written a book. The only uh, thing similar to a book is the writings of John Africa. And we used to uh, give them out freely and openly because it's sections of what we call guidelines on every subject you can imagine, health, nutrition, natural childbirth, um, uh, I mean, everything from the sewers to religion, as we said. Uh, but we don't give them out freely anymore like that because some people got their hands on MOVE guidelines or asked John Africa to write, 
you know, a section on certain things, and they prostituted it. They took it and prostituted it as if, you know, it was something coming from them. So we Mm -hmm. stopped giving them out freely. But we do have a a booklet, like um, 72-page paper booklet, called 25 Years on the Move. It needs to be updated, but there's some very good information, and they're on move. Um, And it's $10. Um, You have to order it from us. We haven't just had the time to try to get to bookstores and get them, you know, to order them from us and carry them in their book. But we do intend to do that right now. That has to come from us. People can go to our website, on a move, O N A M O V E dot com, and you can order it that way. And we'll oh, just mail on, it to you. On, on, on a move, not on the move. Not on the move, no, on a move. O N A M O V E. On a move. Very well. Yeah. All right, I'm I'm glad, I'm glad you spell that out. I'm glad you spell that out because I had written yeah. it down wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, and our okay. number is two one five three eight six one one six five. And we don't hide. We're not anonymous. People can call us. All right. Uh, give give okay. give that last four again, if you would, please, Ramona. Two one five three eight six two one five three eight six one one six five. 